Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Satishka, uh, one of the local consultant assistants in Western Hospital. And today you are here to meet on the Saturday evening on the UK Anesthesia Network for education talk and safety in regional anesthesia. So I'm going to introduce you to the speaker, Dr. Tushar Dixit. He's a consultant anesthetist and the deputy director of anesthetics at the Western Hospital. He has been there for the past 10 years as a consultant. His special interest are uh, regional anesthesia and perioperative medicine. So today he's going to talk about safety in regional anesthesia, which has become very popular after the COVID because uh, and uh, regarding the green environment. So we are, the popularity of regional anesthesia is growing day by day. And there's also uh, the regional anesthesia UK are uh, demanding that there should be a NAP on NAP report for regional anesthesia, which has been uh, mobilized them uh, mobilized by them. So I'm going to introduce to the speaker for today evening, Dr. Tushar Dixit. Over to you, Tushar. Thank you, Satish. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, for inviting me to this forum. Um, uh, the topic I'm going to talk to you about today is safety in regional anesthesia. Uh, primum non nocere. What that means is first do no harm. Um, before I come to this topic, let me introduce myself a tiny bit more detail. Um, so I am the departmental lead for preoperative medicine as well as the de deputy director, but my love lies with regional anesthesia. And outside my NHS work, I do work with um, University of East Anglia uh, in the MSc in regional anesthesia course. And I am a visiting faculty for my own alma mater in India, in KMC uh, Mangalore. Now, before we start this talk, I'd like you all to just have a think about a pilot. We compare our practice a lot to pilots because we are also in the profession of saving lives and improving lives. Um, but occasionally things do go wrong. Think about this pilot. Now, this is an Air India plane that crashed a few years ago in the mountains. Everybody, first blame goes on to the pilot. But no pilot, or not majority of pilots who are involved in a crash want to kill themselves. I'll just read this line to you. Whenever we talk about a pilot who has been killed in a flying accident, we should all keep one thing in mind. He called upon the sum of all his clinical knowledge and he made a judgment. He actually believed in it so strongly that he bet his life on it. That his judgment was faulty is a tragedy, not stupidity. Hence, every instructor, supervisor, whoever spoke to him had an opportunity, had a chance to influence his judgment. So a little bit of all of us goes when every pilot we, with every pilot we lose. What I mean by this is whatever I'm going to tell you, even if it has a slight influence on your judgment in a positive way, then I've achieved my objective for today. Safety is very dear to me. Safety in regional anesthesia, perioperative medicine, anesthesiology as a whole is very dear for all of us. But it's everybody's business. Safety is not a surgeon's problem. It's not a medic's problem or an anesthetist. It's all of us' problem. All of us is problem. Hazards will get through sometimes and things will go wrong with our patients. What we must do is to put successive layers of barriers and safeguards to stop things from going wrong. That's where the practice of anesthesia comes and that's why we are so good at improving safety. And we have learned a lot of this from airline pilots. Hence my reference to the pilots to start the talk. But first, it's really important not to do any harm. I'm a non -nocera. I've left this man's photo on the top uh, because he didn't follow best practice. He went ahead with things without thinking. He caused a lot of harm, in my opinion. The reason I'm saying that is a nerve block it does not have to be done all the time. You don't have to do a nerve block just because you can do it. If you're struggling with a nerve block, don't keep struggling. Failure of a block does not mean failure of an anesthetist. There are various, various ways of managing pain. So if you get your needle in and you can't get it working, don't keep trying. 
because you might cause some harm. Step back, think, and start again. Now, the safety aspect covers before you start a block, and it covers during the block. So you must have the right knowledge, the right training, you must do the right checks, you must have the right people doing the block, you must prepare for your nerve block, you must have the right education, and you must give your patient the right information. Of course, you must check you have the right patient and they have the right operation. And if you get all these things in one place, you will hit the bullseye. Now, in terms of preoperative information, I think that's a really crucial step. And I don't think we are very good at doing this part. We must tell the patient what they are going to have. And that's something we have tried to do in our hospital by giving out these information leaflets. So nerve blocks, common risks, pain, infection, bleeding, nerve damage. And sometimes we say to the patient in a way that the patient sometimes don't recollect it or don't remember it. When things go wrong, the patient will, it leads to litigation. The patient says, I wasn't told anything about it. And that's why we introduced this practice of telling the patient, getting them to sign a piece of paper. This protects the patient because you've given them the information. This protects you and this protects your organization as well because you have proof of doing this. And it becomes really good habit as well. This information on the screen comes from the Royal College of Anesthesia uh, and RAUK. So coming back to the talk, um, I also would like to mention the World Health Organization checklist. And you must have seen stop before you block or the new version, which is prep, stop, block, which is prepare uh, and stop before you put your needle in. What this means is that when you're ready to put your needle in, just stop for a second. Check with your assistant whether you're doing the correct block for the correct patient on the correct side. Um, and also, you need to empower your colleagues, your assistants, your technicians to be able to stop you and say, hold on, you might be in the wrong place. You might be putting the wrong block. You might be on the wrong side. So make sure someone is there to call the halt moment. Let's talk about safety during the block. Now, it is quite common for us to say to a patient, there is a risk of nerve damage, there is a risk of infection, there is a risk of toxicity. These are the common risks. Now, the majority of the focus will be on the nerve damage part uh, today, because I'm sure infection and systemic toxicity is, is uh, uh, something you are all well versed with. Uh, but I will touch on those as well. This is an excellent paper came around eight years ago, and I think it still has the most detailed uh, uh, information about neurological complications associated with regional anesthesia. Now, what is actually the incidence of nerve or neural injury? It's very difficult to know. And the reason is peripheral nerve injuries are very rare. And there is not enough power to conduct RCTs or meta-analysis. And the reason is because they're not reported very well. The usual methods of stratification, such as the Oxford Center for EBM or evidence-based medicine levels of evidence, they don't apply because most of the nerve block injuries are anecdotal. So that's a level four evidence. But anything beyond that, we cannot really quote because there's not many studies done on it. There is a reporting bias. A lot of times nerve injuries get better by themselves and they're not reported. We don't have a registry. Dr. Satish mentioned that the Royal College might be looking at a NAP, a national audit project on this. But currently, there is very limited registry of nerve block injuries. And as I said, consenting process still is very poor. Let's talk about some numbers. NAP3, National Audit Project 2009, was absolutely landmark study. It looked at neuraxial injuries um, in young, old, obstetric, non-obstetric population. And it actually gave us a risk of paraplegia or death, ranging from 0.7 in 100,000 to 1 1.8 per 100,000. It also gave us risk of permanent nerve injury, not leading to death or paraplegia. It showed us that adult epidural anesthetic blocks are perhaps the riskiest of the lot. But even then, the risk of injuries is quite small. A similar Swedish study looked at 1.7 million uraxial blocks. And it found out 
they were 33 spinal hematomas, for example, um, in patients on 21 epidural blockades. Now, the numbers are actually extremely small, but they are significant and life-changing for those who it happens to. But when it comes to um, neuraxial factors that contribute to neuraxial injuries, we now know that epidurals are more likely to lead to injuries than spinal anesthetics. That may be to do with the size of needle, the absence of a clear endpoint like CSF, um, increasing age, older you are, higher is your, is your risk of having neuraxial injuries. Females are more prone to have neuraxial injuries, coagulation abnormalities, pre-existing neurological damage such as diabetes mellitus or spinal stenosis can be contributory. The commonest epidural is done for labor analgesia, but the risk of neuraxial injuries is the lowest. In fact, it is quite high in orthopedic epidurals. But coming to peripheral nerve injuries, in early post-operative period, mild paresthesias actually can be present in up to 15% patients undergoing a nerve block. This is, if you look at patients having awake nerve blocks, paresthesia is quite common. That should really be a part of neurological injury, isn't it? Um, which is fairly transient and wears off very quickly. Most of these will resolve within days to weeks. 99% will resolve within a year. And serious neurological injuries, all cause uh, reporting is as 2.4 per 10,000 nerve blocks. That's again a very small number. 24 out of 100,000 nerve blocks will lead to serious neurological injury. This is despite of a serious reporting bias. So what factors contribute to uh, peripheral nerve injury? You have patient factors and you have surgical factors. Patient factors are quite similar to, neuro, to, to uh, central uh, neuraxial blockade, pre-existing neurological diseases, diabetes, extremes of body habitus, extremely thin or extremely obese. Male are most likely to have peripheral nerve injuries, um, extremes of age, of course, and proximal more than distal. So interscalene blocks, your lumbar and brachial uh, lumbar plexus blocks, sacral plexus blocks. These are more likely to lead to nerve damage. Surgical factors, such as direct trauma or stretch, common in patients having surgery lithotomy position or due to compressive dressings or plaster of Harris casts, tonique, hematomas, abscesses, any sort of perioperative inflammation, generalized swelling, patients end up on intensive care, they get anasaka for various reasons that could lead to nerve damage. Patient positioning is probably one of the commonest reasons for surgical factors. We are all responsible. So what is the cause of peripheral nerve block? Of course, regional anesthesia, we are putting need a needle near a nerve, uh, it can cause damage to the nerve, but also don't forget, general anesthesia is potentially a cause as well. I have personal experience of this. A patient who had uh, interscalene block for uh, shoulder surgery in, in beach chair position, woke up with a hemiglossal loss of sensation, so a numb tongue. And that was due to effect of an eye gel, a uh, laryngeal mask or supraglottic device. So that was the reason patient had nerve damage and that recovered within six weeks. So general anesthesia potentially is responsible as well. Let's blame somebody. Let's blame the orthopedic surgeons. We like to do that, don't we? So looking at shoulder surgery, arthroscopic shoulder surgery, there is a risk of nerve damage up to 10% due to port placement and traction. Similar things with elbow surgery. Risk of elbow replacement, there is 10% risk of ulnar neuropathy. Hip surgery, especially uh, hip arthroscopies, can, be, can lead to nerve damage. There can be sciatic and femoral nerve block related injuries, um, femoral nerve related injuries uh, during hip surgery. Knee surgeries, again, arthroscopic ACL repairs can damage the saphenous nerve. Tonike, this is a fight I have quite regularly with uh, the uh, orthopedic surgeons. More than two hours of tonike time, 120 minutes of tonike time is associated with nerve damage. 
and we should always keep reminding our surgeons to be mindful of nerve damage. Um, even if the nerve damage is transient, patients can develop compartment syndrome as a result of tonic time, which can lead to nerve damage. Now I'm going to focus a little bit on the anatomy of a nerve. Why does nerve damage happen? Now, if you can see the pointer, there is a nerve axon, which is covered by the endoneurium. These axons are packed together in, in a fascicle, which is covered by the perineurium. Lots of fascicles are packed in together. Uh, lots of nerves are packed in together. Uh, sorry, lots of neurons are packed in together inside the fascicle, which are then packed together inside the nerve. So you can see the epineurium covering the whole nerve with multiple fascicles inside the nerve with various axons inside each fascicle. But you can also see there are blood vessels, arteries and veins within the perineurium. Here is a histological um, example of how the nerve fascicles will look like. Now, what happens when we use ultrasound? These nerve fascicles can be of, can range from uh, 0 0.05 uh, millimeters to 0 0.02 millimeters. While when we use ultrasound, the 15 megahertz linear probe has a spatial resolution of 0 0.2 millimeters, which means an ultrasound actually cannot see individual fascicles very clearly. And that would clearly show that ultrasound will not prevent nerve damage every time. So how do anesthetists cause nerve damage? There are various ways. We can insert the needle directly into a nerve and cut the nerve with a needle potentially. So needle trauma. Intraneural injection. Now, an intraneural injection doesn't mean it's, there, there is going to be nerve damage. It means uh, there is an intraneural injection but not always, because there are other mechanisms by which nerve damage can happen, and I'll come to that in a second. Sometimes we can inject in the wrong place next to the nerve. There could be an extra neural hematoma or an intraneural hematoma, which can lead to neuronal ischemia. And of course, LA toxicity. LA Just to give you an example of an intraneural injection, if you look at this needle entry into a fascicle, the needle tip has gone inside the fascicle. The local anesthetic has been injected within the perineurium, and this has caused the bulging of the perineurium. But the needle tip or part of the needle tip is inside the fascicle, and that's created a shrink. Okay? Now imagine if this was a blood vessel. The needle comes in, you inject subperineurally and you get an excellent nerve block with a very low dose local anesthetic. But if this needle went inside and there's a blood vessel right at the tip of it, you can cause an intraneural hematoma. This neural hematoma will expand potentially because of patient's blood pressure when they're waking up, and this could lead to a nerve damage. So there are various mechanisms that can lead to nerve damage. But the important thing to remember is that they're extremely rare. Now you must know the classification of nerve injuries. This is an exam question in the final FRC and the primary FRC. Um, there is Sunderland and Seddon type classification, which is commonly used, starting from mild uh, neuropraxia to most severe neurotmesis. What we know that most neuropraxia will recover within a few weeks, while neurotmesis will not recover without surgery. In the middle, there are various stages and it depends on the extent of the damage. That brings me to a really important concept called the double crush theory. And this happens in pre-existing neurological conditions. Now, sometimes some of our colleagues are concerned about putting a nerve block in somebody who has nerve damage already. As long as you clearly document that nerve damage, you are safe to put a nerve block but you have to warn the patient that there is an increased risk of neurological injury. And that is about communication, communicating with the patient, talking about benefits and risks. Now, just to demonstrate what the double crush theory means, um, you have a normal neuron with a cell body and an exoplasmic flow away from the cell body. If you have a 
minor stimulus or a minor nerve damage stimulus. There may be neuropraxia. There may be some nerve damage which will recover. If you had multiple minor uh, nerve damage stimuli, such as you try to block a median nerve and then you do an axillary block and at both blocks you cause nerve damage, that could potentially lead to denervation. If you had a major single stimulus, you could lead to denervation. But if you have a pre-existing neurological damage, such as diabetes, multiple sclerosis, uh, polyneuropathies of any kind, even a minor nerve damage could lead to denervation. And hence, you've got to explain to the patient that you can have a block. It is good for pain relief, but there is a small chance of increased risk of nerve damage. There are some facts that I'd like to share with you. Paresthesia during needle advancement or during local anesthetic in the injection does not mean it's peripheral nerve damage is happening. Does not, it's, it is not predictive of peripheral nerve damage. And there is, again, not great evidence, but it's a level three evidence available. Now, all of us who have done awake blocks know that the patient will sometimes complain of tingling and paresthesia. But that doesn't mean they're having nerve damage. It is very rare to see nerve damage because of that. Pain on injection is not a reliable indicator. Now, some people have this opinion that if you do a nerve block while the patient's awake, it is better, better for the patient because you can detect nerve damage. But pain is actually not a reliable indicator. So patient does not complain of pain, you can still cause nerve damage. And if the patient complains of pain, doesn't mean that you have nerve damage. Intraneural injection does not always lead to PNI or peripheral nerve injury. Now, there's a paper by Hartzik who, where he has looked at uh, uh, sciatic nerves, popliteal sciatic blocks, and they deliberately injected intraneural with a very small dose of local anesthetic. And they found the block was extremely effective and risk of nerve damage was very small. What we know that intrafascicular needle insertion should certainly be avoided. Okay, and certainly the injection should be avoided because even if your needle goes in, if you don't inject, you're again less likely to cause nerve damage. Let's talk about nerve localization. The matter of fact, no nerve localization is technique is superior than the other. Peripheral nerve stimulation is still commonly used around the world. It is not very sensitive, but it's quite specific for nerve to needle contact. What that means is if you do not get a stimulus, you are not near the nerve. We can accept any response threshold between 0.2 and 0.5 milliampere. Anything more than 0.5, you're probably away from the nerve. Anything less than 0.2 milliampere, you're probably extremely close or in the nerve. But peripheral nerve injury can happen despite of using peripheral nerve stimulator. And I'll explain to you why. Sciatic nerve is a big nerve, has motor and sensory components. If your needle tip is not is, is near a sensory component, you will not get a motor response. But you will try to move your needle up and down trying to get a response. And due to those repeated movements, you can potentially cause nerve damage without getting any peripheral nerve stimulation. I've seen a lot of these uh, little toys in the market. They are called injection pressure monitors. Um, B. Braun has one. This is from B. Braun, I think, and it's quite uh, uh, publicized. But these are very subjective and they're often in inaccurate. Again, high injection pressures are bad. If you are struggling to inject, don't inject because you're probably either in a nerve structure or in a fascial structure. Low injection pressures are good. Anything below 15 PSI is good, but you could also be inside a vein or an artery. So always aspirate and low injection pressures do not mean that everything is good. It is a negative predictor tool, but it's a good tool to have if you combine it with something else. Let's talk about my favorite bit, the ultrasound. Ultrasound is 50 shades of gray for some, and it's uh, an expertise for someone else. But I've got some bad news for you. Ultrasound is not associated with reduced risk of post-operative neurological symptoms or post-operative nerve injury. 
or perineural nerve injuries. It can detect subperineural injections, but not intrafascicular. For the reasons I mentioned to you before, the spatial and the axial um, resolution of an ultrasound is not good enough at the moment with the machines we have to look at each fascicle separately. Ultrasound is, of course, subjective, but it does improve your speed, your success of doing a block, speed of doing a block, and potentially you can identify blood vessels and stay away from them. So what should be used? Maybe you can use all three techniques if you have them available, which means you're increasing your chance of success. Use something. I think better than doing a blind block or a, just a landmark guided block, use peripheral nerve stimulator or an ultrasound or injection pressure monitor, or you can use all three. Safety somewhere lies there where you use all three perhaps. We should always also look at needle types. Now, needle types are quite important because there was a time when we used to use hypodermic needles to inject local anesthetic. Nerve trauma is lower when you, we use a short bevel needle as compared to a long bevel needle, which is a hypodermic needle. Also, the problem is the short bevel or the blunted needle can cause more damage if it goes intraneuronally. So there are pros and cons, but overall, a short bevel needle is better. Needle approach. Now, this is an anatomical study looking at uh, when you approach an, a nerve with using an ultrasound, you should perhaps look at approaching the nerve at a tangent rather than aim for the middle of the nerve. Because if you cannot see your needle properly, you could go through a nerve like a kebab, and you don't want that. So if this is, for example, an interscalene traffic light appearance of your nerves, your needles should aim at maybe 11 o'clock or 5 o'clock, rather than aiming bang in the middle at 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock. That will reduce the risk of nerve injuries, and it is evidence-based by a paper from Salaban. Now, Infection, I won't go in much detail. Of course, you understand that infections can be devastating, although risk of infections from peripheral nerve blockage is extremely small. Every department has their own practice. Some people do a full scrub, including um, uh, theta gowns for a nerve block, while some people use sterile gloves, clean the area, and use some sort of uh, nerve sheath or a condom for the uh, ultrasound probe. Let me talk to you about systemic toxicity. Now, this is something which I have not seen personally happen, but it has happened in my own hospital and it has happened elsewhere. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity is a serious business. And the reason is the wrong drug at the wrong dose, giving through the wrong route. I won't go through in detail into this. There are various versions of what is the toxic levels for various kind of local anesthetics, but levobupivacaine, which is used in my hospital, we tend not to go beyond two milligram per kilogram. Um, but again, the data with adrenaline is quite limited. Lignocaine is a bit safer and it is slightly better for the heart. Comparing bupivacaine and levobupivacaine, again, levobupivacaine is slightly safer, ever so slightly safer if there is local anesthetic toxicity. What factors can contribute to the central nervous system effects of local anesthetic toxicity? High plasma concentration, of course. Speed of injection, which means higher pressure gradient, which means higher blood plasma levels. If your patient is hyperkalemic or hypercapneic, then the risk of neurological injury or neurological effects of local anesthetic toxicity is higher. How would you manage local anesthetic toxicity? Well, there is an antidote, not exactly an antidote, but it does help in resuscitation. That's called intralipid. The current practice in UK hospitals is you should not put a nerve block if there is no intralipid available, as you will not give an opiate if there is no naloxone available. What you can see here is a trolley with a drawer called local anesthetic toxicity drawer. This is in my hospital. If there is an emergency, we can pull the drawer out and it has everything that you need to manage local anesthetic toxicity. You can build something like this in your own hospital. And this, is, this trolley itself 
is being adopted by the Royal College of Anesthesia as one of their best practice guides. Let's look at local anesthetic toxicity management. Again, this is something which is widely available, but if there is, if you suspect that following an injection of local anesthetic, there is a change in mental status, patient becomes agitated, or there is loss of consciousness, patient starts to convulse or develops cardiovascular collapse. Of course, stop injecting the local anesthetic and call for help. Ask someone to get your local anesthetic toxicity kit. In our case, the crisis trolley. Give them 100% oxygen, secure airway. Check and confirm IV access. Assess your A, B, and C. Control the seizures with benzodiazepines or thiopentone. And if there is cardiac arrest, start CPR and start giving the intralipid. Now, if there is a circulatory arrest or arrhythmias, you can use uh, your standard medication, but do not use lidocaine, obviously. And consider intravenous intralipid if there is hypotension, bradycardia, or any sort of arrhythmias. This patient will have to go to critical care, of course, afterwards. Make sure that we check the daily serum amylase because with intralipid, high dose lipids, there is a risk of pancreatitis. And make sure you report or, or uh, register these events somewhere. So as a summary of this talk, you must know your machine. If you have an ultrasound machine, you should know how to use it, how to change the depth, how to change the, the gain, um, and how to use the right settings. Make sure you know your anatomy. Ultrasound is of no use if you don't know what you're looking for. So make sure Teach your trainees, teach your colleagues the anatomy that is required uh, for the ultrasound. Know your pharmacology. Of course, knowledge of drugs is quite important here. You must have a well-trained assistant. Don't put a nerve block completely on your own. Have some help. Use a well-lit room. Have the ergonomics. Don't hurt your neck, hurt your back. Keep the ultrasound right in front of you. Have resuscitation equipment available have guidelines for managing local anesthetic toxicity, have intralipid. And I keep saying this, but have the correct patient, the correct site, and the correct block. What I would say is always use a blunted needle rather than a hypodermic needle. Use something for localization. Could be a peripheral nerve stimulator, could be an ultrasound. You can use an injection pressure monitor, or you can inject yourself if you don't have a pressure monitor. I strongly believe that you should inject the local anesthetic yourself. One is you take the responsibility for it. Secondly, we have the most experience as compared to a technician. We have the feel of the tissues. And I think that's quite an important thing to do. You don't have to hold the needle tight. Let go of the needle. Needle will not move anywhere and inject the local anesthetic yourself. Aim at a tangent, five o'clock or 11 o'clock, tangential approach. Have local policies of managing when things go wrong. What if the block doesn't work? What about rescue blocks? Uh, what if there is toxicity? Must have a guidance for managing local anesthetic toxicity. And all I can say is practice, practice, and practice. Thank you for listening. Thank you for patience. And I'll take any questions if there are any. Hi, Tusha. Well, then, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. It was very informative. And my only question is regarding the concentration of the local anesthetics, what we are using. So my question is, will there be any chance if you use a lesser concentration of local anesthetics and increase the volume of the drug rather than giving a strong uh, concentration, like say 0.5%, 10 ml, rather than instead of giving 0.5, 10 ml, instead of giving that, give 0.25%, 20 ml, is that make any difference to any peripheral nerve blockade, uh, to the peripheral nerve injury, what it costs during the peripheral nerve blockade? Thanks, Satish. Um, in my experience, um, it depends on what block you're doing for what situation and what condition and how long you want your block to last and what kind of complications can happen because of a high concentration block. For example, if you are doing a, a brachial plexus block, a proximal brachial flux block that can lead to phrenic nerve paresis. 
So if you put a high concentration block, high volume block, it will last quite long. But if you're doing a peripheral, uh, uh, an abdominal wall block, you require a lot of volume. You can't use a high concentration block. So it depends on the reason what you're doing it for. I mean, I think, I don't think there is hard and fast rule. If <clears throat> I want to reduce the amount of local anesthetic I want to give, I'll use a low concentration block. If I'm doing a surgical procedure awake with under, uh, the under block only, then I want a faster onset. I want a longer duration. Uh, it, I want it to last for the duration of the surgery and I want it to start working quickly uh, so that you can start the operation, in which case I will use a higher concentration block. Do well, I thank you very much. answer your question? Eh? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tushar. For, uh... Uh, Dr. Satish, uh, uh, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Tushar, when I do uh, popliteal sciatic block, I usually see like a big, uh, like a black hole. In uh, do you know when where where the two nerves will will meet together or will will separate? Usually there is uh, there is a big. Uh, um, uh, so I feel sometimes this is a, a blood vessel, but uh, I'm not sure what is your experience about this this view, like. Uh, when uh, the the main sciatic ends and uh, we have the two branches, the common coronal and the tibial, um, do you, do you see this frequently? And if this is like a, a blood vessel or this is just a space between the two branches that we can go to and inject uh, the medication at this time, at this place. So, I do a foot and ankle list every week, and I do this is one of the commonest blocks I do, and um, if you look at the sciatic nerve you when you scan it at the level of the knee you will see the, the 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 tibial component and as you scan up you'll see the peroneal component coming together and then you see a little dumbbell shape isn't it and yes. then as you go up it starts to become more roundish before it becomes more flattish so at the point where it's become a dumbbell because they're in the same perineural sheath that is what sometimes looks like a black hole but it could be a blood vessel now if you are in doubt, put your Doppler on it and check because most ultrasound machines will have a Doppler on it. Um, I have not come across um, regularly uh, big blood vessels in that area. Um, but of course, aspirate before you inject, um, use your Doppler. Um, but I think what you might be talking about is that perineural sheath becoming a common perineural sheath. And then there is a bit of a hole there, a bit of a gap there. That is where I bring my needle in usually for a sciatic nerve block, popliteal sciatic block, where the dumbbell, when the sheath comes together. And if you inject in one place, you actually don't have to go up and down. The local anesthetic just spreads. Uh, it's like a trousers of a, you know, a trouser and the legs coming down. So the point at which the legs come together, the trouser bit, that's where you should inject. Uh, but I have not seen many big blood vessels in that area usually. Uh, there are blood vessels there, of course, because there are blood vessels uh, under the nerve. So the, the, the anatomical arrangement is nerve and then artery and vein, isn't it? So artery and vein could be below and above. They could be side by side. But I've not come across inside the nerve a big vessel. Uh, yeah, yeah, you said like dumbbell shaped. I, I usually say uh, be not shaped. It is the same idea when, when you, you have the two branches still but they are in, in in one sheet still in one sheet and uh, there is that space which is like very very um, welcoming uh, space there to go with the needle but sometimes it is so rounded and so like uh, the picture of a blood vessel so i i say okay no don't go there but this is a good idea really to do the doubler have you done the doubler on this and uh, um... i mean as i said i have not found a blood vessel there but but when i'm doing other kinds of blocks uh, I use the Doppler quite a lot. You know, when I'm in doubt, I'll put the Doppler on. Okay. Um, but make sure you don't press very hard because you compress the vessels. So you have to just release the pressure on your probe slightly. And then you can see the blood vessel. Um, arteries are easier to see, but certain blocks like axillary nerve block, despite of least amount of pressure, you can compress veins and you can still cause um, local anesthetic toxicity. So Doppler is quite a useful thing to have. 
Um, okay. So there is another question. Sorry, Satish, this was sent to me. I'm not sure if you received this question or not. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Obama, do you want to go through this? Do you want to, uh, or I can give the question. Okay, so uh, Obama is asking, uh, in case of epidural injection, uh, is there any prophylactic measures uh, if blood aspiration occurred? Um, interesting question. Um, you, do you mean any prophylactic measures to stop aspirating blood? Is that what you're asking or? Uh, I think we can, Dr. Obama, if you want to uh, clarify it a, a bit more so we can, he, he said in the previous message, when to start suspecting epidural hematoma. Uh, when to start suspecting epidural hematoma. Yeah. So if, um, we have actually some experience of this. Uh, in my trust, we've had two epidural hematomas in the last uh, five years or so. Um, so one was an epidural hematoma and one was an epidural abscess, actually. Any patient who's got a persistent epidural um, uh, effect after removal of the epidural, um, anything more than six hours, you should start observing that patient very carefully. Anything beyond 12 hours, you should start, and, and there is serious motor or sensory blockage, you should start thinking about it, maybe thinking about scanning them. But if the patient have, has any sort of uh, uh, signs such as pain, numbness, tingling, uh, and it's gone more than expected 12 hours or so, I would go and get an MRI scan done, to be honest. Um, but epidural hematoma is extremely difficult to diagnose you need a very high level of suspicion. Um, and as I said, we have this experience of a hematoma turning into an abscess. And that was because the patient had a dermal implant, which is a, a, a common thing in, uh, in some UK youngsters. They had some tattoos done, which were not visible actually to us. And they never told us about it. Patient had an epidural put in and epidural was taken out. Uh, but they had a small hematoma which got infected. And actually it was the MRI which found out those dermal implants, which are only uh, five, six centimeters away from the epidural site, which no one knew about and patients didn't tell us. Um, so yes, you have to have a very high degree of suspicion. Anybody who's having a persistent nerve blockage, uh, more than what you would normally expect, which is usually six hours, you should start thinking about it and anybody more than 12 hours with associated uh, signs such as pain or numbness or severe paresthesias uh, should have scanning or investigations now. Uh, that's great, thank you. Uh, I think that's clear now. Um, Tusha, one more question, Tusha. I've got a, a, a doubt regarding mixing of two local anesthetic in one single syringe for giving a faster uh, onset, because I've been told that people do mix lignocaine and levopipuacaine in one single syringe for doing a peripheral nerve blockade. What are your thoughts about it? Again, uh, interesting question, Satish. This is something which you will hear different opinions from different regional experts. So uh, I know within our region, there are some who believe that uh, uh, mixing is not a good idea. Uh, because it only dilutes your local anesthetic. So if you want to do an awake block and you want faster onset, you need to put the highest possible concentration, which is 0.5% or 0.75% uh, in case of um, levobupivacaine. Um, what personally I do is I occasionally mix them uh, with lignocaine and levobupivacaine, um, <laughs> but I would have to reduce the dose of one or the other. And usually, if you are going to mix them, then any long-acting local anesthetic, you should drop the dose by a third. Okay, drop the dose of that long-acting local anesthetic by one third, and then use a third of the local anesthetic of the short-acting. So if you're mixing lignocaine and levobupivacaine in a 70 kilo patient, uh, and you would normally give them 150 milligrams of levobupivacaine, drop the dose down to 100 and give them 50 to 100 milligrams of lignocaine. So uh, if you're going to mix them together, 
then reduce the dose of the long acting local anesthetic but you must be aware that it will dilute your local anesthetic so oh. there are other ways of doing this if you want to do awake hand surgery uh, the what practice we do use either you can put half percent of levobupivacaine high volume in the supraclavicular area and numb it completely okay which means your block will last for next two days or so uh, which means patient will have a very numb arm so we will put local anesthetic with adrenaline for the supraclavicular and then we will put some long acting local anesthetic in the peripheral nerves uh, so they get an immediate relief with local anesthetic with lignocaine and adrenaline and then long acting post op analgesia with the levobupivacaine so there are various ways of doing this uh, but as i said if you ask different people you get different opinions um, it depends on what you need it for thank you very much uh, just to, to clarify my question about the reflective measures of if the blood aspiration occurs i mean that uh, sometimes we uh, during uh, epidural uh, insertion during uh, needle insertion sometimes we we found blood aspiration and sometimes it may occur uh, uh, for one or more, more times and maybe two times or three times during the re, uh, the, the, the trial to insert to the epidural uh, there's any some anything to be sure that um, the the epidural will not will not happen now care that's that's my question okay. uh, second okay. question uh, mm -hmm. about the epidural also if um, uh, if epidural puncture occurs uh, maybe also one or more time uh, does the injection of saline is is now uh, or, or or insertion of the epidural or at least uh, injection of uh, epidural once may, may uh, decrease the incidence of uh, post uh, post uh, post operative headache or post spinal headache thank you very much uh, so the first question is about uh, epidural hematoma or, or sorry uh, blood tap so if that you have a blood tap uh, once or twice in one area our usual practice here and that's what we will advise the trainees that if you have blood tap in two areas or two spaces uh, more than twice then you should abandon the epidural now it is quite difficult to predict where the blood vessels are um, if you get blood tap in one space uh, at first attempt you should have no more than one more attempt at that because if there is a blood vessel there you will still find it okay if you have it at the second space and you get blood again i don't think there is uh, any worth in trying the epidural because you can potentially keep causing harm and this epidural hematoma will go up but i don't think you can predict that there is no way of actually uh, prophylactically figuring out because you can't see it you can't scan it okay um so yeah, yeah as far as i know unless dr ali uh, knows something better uh, as far as i know i don't think you can predict or or use any prophylactic measures uh, to reduce the blood taps um, the second part of your question was about the postural puncture headache so the current advisory here is if you get a a csf tap with an epidural needle you should put a catheter into that and the reason for that is that there is some evidence that the dura mater will start to close around the catheter and the risk of post of pdph is reduced or uh, a blood patch is need for blood patches is reduced as well um that doesn't mean that sometimes you know it's a reflex that as soon as we get csf we pull the needle back out and it happens quite a lot and that's why there is a bit of reporting bias with dural punctures um injection of saline i am not aware of any evidence that it reduces risk of your post uh, uh, dural puncture headache it used to be a practice i remember people used to put 50 ml of saline in um, to reduce the risk of pdph but i don't think there is any solid evidence for that it does make sense that you're filling the epidural space with high pressure uh, but i don't think that's something we um uh, teach our trainees at the moment 
Dr. Ali, you do a lot more obstetrics than I do. Uh, yes, I, I, think I, I don't have anything yeah. different. You finish, Ali, yeah. <clears throat> you, can, you carry on, Ali. Yeah. I, I'm done. I, I don't have anything extra from uh, what Tushar has said, actually, about this point. Right. Uh, Tushar, so when we do the epidural and where the most of the time the blood tap occurs when the thread in the catheter, and then the blood comes in through the catheter, and then they said, okay, let's stop it, let's do the next phase. Because I attended one of the European webinars, the obstetric webinars. One of the uh, consultants there has told that if you, once finding the epidural space, use 10 ml of normal saline and slowly inject into the space. And which means that before inserting your catheter, you can just push the blood vessels away from your target. So, and you can just cut it and then you can use the catheter. In that way, you can reduce the incidence of a blood trap through the catheter. Thanks, Satish. Um, maybe, uh, see, when we do epidurals, I mean, in, in, in our practice, epidurals are not done very often these days, except labor epidurals. Um, we use saline mostly rather than air. Okay, uh, So you, you're already injecting saline when you go yeah. into it. If you get a blood into your catheter, you normally withdraw the catheter and then see if there is any blood coming back. Isn't it? Yeah. If you withdraw the catheter, there is a possibility that the, the tip of the catheter, catheter has come out of the blood vessel. Okay, But if, if you keep getting blood despite of withdrawing, then I would not push saline and play. I'll just take it out and do it again. No. No, no, the thing is, even before putting in the catheter, once you find the epidural space, before the catheter goes in, you can dilate the epidural space with 10 ml of normal saline. That was the, the advice given by one of the consultants uh, during the talk, actually. He said that this reduces the incidence of hitting your, um, the blood vessel with your tip of the epidural catheter. So before putting the catheter, just dilate, uh, just dilate the space, epidural space with some 10 ml of normal saline, and then you can thread in the catheter. Yeah, I mean, it sounds plausible, doesn't it? Yeah, it's something yeah. which is worth looking at. But yeah. coming to peripheral nerve injuries, uh, if you were doing a lumbar plexus block yeah. uh, using a needle and you're looking for nerves twitching and nerve stimulation, um, and you put your needle in and then you get blood. Mm. So you got your twitching and then yeah. a trickle of blood comes out into your, uh, your, your, your uh, stimuplex needle. Then what are we going to do about it? If you, so the advisory there, some people, uh, some experts in lumbar plexus block I've spoken to, what they do is they don't connect a syringe of saline or anything to while performing a lumbar plexus block. They leave the whole tubing open to air so that if you are in a blood vessel, the blood, because of the pr positive pressure, will just come out into the catheter. And that reduces risk of uh, uh, intravascular injections during a lumbar plexus or sacral plexus block. Uh, the same principle is what you're saying that in epidural space, as soon as you get your loss of resistance, you just inject saline and that will move away the blood vessels, little yeah. blood vessels. Yeah. I'm not so sure that that will always happen. And again, it's you need a high degree of vigilance there, don't you? Yeah. Uh, Tushar, Thank I you, just want to ask about another, uh, another thing. You, you told me that you are doing lots of ankle surgeries. Um, uh, I can see that the my for for my from my experience my my like uh, uh, success rate in doing the ankle block is maybe higher than doing the uh, popliteal sciatic. Uh, so I usually lean towards giving ankle ultrasound guided ankle more than uh, doing uh, popliteal sciatic. But the idea is when you have a, a surgery in the ankle itself. Uh, do you usually do just popliteal sciatic or uh, a high ankle can be can be enough to do that surgery? For example, distal tibia fracture or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, my practice uh, for any surgery on the forefoot and midfoot, I do um, ankle blocks. Anything in the hind foot, calcaneum or above or ankle, they get a popliteal block basically, because you can get everything in one injection, apart from adductor canal or, or, or saphenous block anyways. But apart from that, you get everything in one go. Ankle blocks are quite reliably block uh, forefoot and midfoot for me. So any Liz-Frank's fractures, bunions, 
any sort of joint fusions, PIP fusions, you can do them quite safely. But when we are doing Achilles tendon surgery, for example, or we are doing calcaneal osteotomies, I find the popliteal block works much better. Now with high ankle blocks, problem with high ankle blocks is your posterior tibial uh, artery is your landmark for the posterior tibial nerve. As you go higher, especially in a leg which is muscular or obese, that nerve is going to dip away from the artery and it goes really deep. So unless you can scan the nerve quite proximally, you can of course block it. By all means, you can block it. But the rest of the nerves, like the peroneals, they become more difficult. And then you're looking at the fibular neck to find your lateral, the common peroneal nerve there. And then, which means you're blocking a nerve very close to the bone. Uh, and then you have the same problems of neuronal ischemia and things. So popliteal block actually covers everything. Now, popliteal block is not the easiest block to do if you don't do it regularly. Uh, but in my practice, anything which is midfoot and uh, forefoot gets an ankle block. Anything which is hind foot or ankle gets a popliteal block along with the erector canal block. Okay, so I shouldn't try then. So sometimes I just think, oh, why not just to go up a bit? Uh, as you said, like uh, finding the nerves is easy around the ankle when you go up and every nerve goes in, a, in another way and the anatomy changes. It is a bit difficult to trace this nerve from down to up to, to block it up. And uh, that's why I was asking about your experience with that. Okay. And it is always better to block the posterior tibial ultrasound guided slightly above the ankle. Uh, at least two to three centimeters above the ankle because your needle insertion point uh, can easily go to the Achilles tendon. You don't want that. You don't want the needle to go through a tendon called tendon tendinopathy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I'm not sure, Tushar, if you have any more questions or... Tushar? Uh, no, I can't say. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Satish. Satish? Oh, okay. So, uh, so I, I think we're just gonna finish now at this point. Um, I would thank you, Tushar. I really enjoyed this um, uh, lecture, this presentation. It has lots of information. Do you know? I was a bit busy during the 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 presentation itself, uh, organizing things. But uh, I, I, from my, I have got. Uh, it was it was really great. It was like like very practical, uh, like fo focusing on the most important things that we need to avoid. Uh, I, it is really uh, will be of benefit for for everyone who is doing regional anesthesia. And uh, thank you very much for that, Tushar. My pleasure. Thank, thank you very Tushar. much. It was a wonderful talk. It was very very useful, probably for everyone who have participated. And I thank everyone who have participated in today's talk and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>